I'm Steve Rich. Um, I'm one of the NSTA Press authors, but more importantly, a science teacher of 20 years um, who's worked with students and teachers in the community to build outdoor classrooms and uh, teach good lessons outside. So um, today what we'll do is we'll explore using some natural materials in the classroom. Some of those will be um, items that you can find outside just for free. Uh, we'll talk about how we'll pay for those science lessons. We'll look at reading and writing about um, science outdoors and everybody's got free seeds to take home and then we have a chance to win door prizes. So um, before we start, I wanted to draw your attention to something and I'm giving a little plug for the NSTA class packs. Um, they've put together a kit of the materials that go with my books and what they've done is just find the materials um, and package them together so that everything you need to teach the lessons is available. There are some samples of the kits in the bookstore uh, if you want to stop by and look at those. And uh, I'll be happy to talk to you about those. Um, NSTA, get, I don't make any profits from those and they've priced them so that they're not really making a big profit. But take a look at those and just kind of see if it's something that might help you. And if, if you don't want that class pack, it kind of gives you an idea of what you would need if you want to buy it on your own. Let's look at this cartoon for a second. So the mom says, see, this is called The Outdoors. And the son says, oh, I've seen this level on my video games. And I remember when my own son was young and he would look at his Game Boy and he would hold it so close to his face that he would walk into things and he couldn't even see anything else but the game, the video screen. And I've faced that challenge with my own students too. And I think it's important for us to get them outdoors and to have them explore the natural world and put uh, the games down for a little bit and just to unplug. One of the people who really thinks getting kids outdoors um, is important is our first lady, Michelle Obama. She has this Let's Move campaign, and uh, these kids went to the White House to help plant the White House garden, which many of you might be familiar with. Just, just this week, they've planted a pollinator garden in addition to their kitchen garden. So let's take a look at some garden designs that might work in schools. Um, this is a design that is, um, was built at an elementary school, and it's featured in um, Outdoor Science, a Practical Guide. And uh, you'll see kind of the four red diamond shaped areas. Those are what I call math patios. And we'll talk about how those are used a little bit, some activities that can be done there. And in the photograph, they correspond with this area here and the area back there. This photograph was taken while the outdoor classroom was still in progress and not quite finished, but it gives you an idea of the perspective. So having a good plan for your outdoor classroom is really important. I think that you can come up with a good plan by thinking first about your curriculum, talking to administrators and making sure you have permission to do what you want to do in the schoolyard, and then involving teachers and parents in the community. And these are some photographs from parent days and um, community days. The one on the bottom right is when we had a day that Starbucks sent out some volunteers to help us. One of the things that they did was bring coffee grounds that could be used as compost in the garden. And even more importantly, they sent manpower or woman power to help us um, with some projects that we were doing. So that was very helpful and it got them involved. And so it kind of gave them some connection to the school. And when they would see me stop in, they would say, hey, what's going on in the garden? Do you need anything? Can we help you? So uh, establishing those relationships with various businesses is really helpful. This is the middle school outdoor classroom plan. It's also um, in Outdoor Science Practical Guide. And this one has one large patio right in the center. And it's surrounded by four different types of gardens, a large seating area, and then a few other elements at the bottom. And we'll see some photographs of those. These, were take, these photos were taken when the middle schoolers were helping build out our classroom. And they were in after school science club. And it helped to have them there to um, be after school so we could kind of veer away from curriculum a little bit because I needed some uh, workers. And, the good thing about having them come after school, um, in addition to that, was that um, you know, we, we could take more than a class period of time. When I was teaching middle school, we had about an hour of class time with each class. And as you can imagine, stopping what we're doing to build an outdoor classroom wasn't going to happen a whole lot during the school day. This is a photo um, at, right after we'd finished. You can see the corner of the patio, the bird garden before the plants got big, and some of the seating area. Um, these are a couple of other schools' gardens that I wanted to highlight. I didn't um, help create these gardens, but I visited them. They both have raised beds, and this one has raised beds that were each uh, monitored by a grade level, and they're right outside the doors to the school cafeteria. This school partnered 
um, teachers with Cafeteria Manager and they applied for a federal grant that helps to make uh, cafeteria meals um, and the cafeteria uh, management uh, a more sustainable type of operation. And so those raised beds were used for both herbs and vegetables. The vegetables went into the salad bar and the herbs for seasoning in their cooking. If you don't want to have an outdoor classroom or you can't for some reason, um, or if you're planning one, some alternate ideas to having a, a facility where you're taking kids to, or just to take something outside for them to sit on, whether it's a blanket or a towel for them to sit on. Um, looking at what's already on the school grounds, existing flower beds, um, trying to improve those, give them a purpose for learning rather than just being a flower bed. And at the very least, making observations from your classroom windows. Um, we'll talk about an activity with the Cornell um, Lab of Ornithology called the Great American Backyard Bird Count. And that can actually be done without taking your kids outside if you have a good window. This is one of the resources I found on the NSTA exhibit hall floor, uh, schoolyardfilms.org. They're located in Florida, so many of the films on their website are kind of based in that ecosystem. But it gave me some ideas that I used with kids to have them go out with um, little flip cameras or smartphones to go out and make their own videos of the outdoors. Um, and then I've occasionally done them myself. One day um, when I was getting ready for a presentation to kids, um, I was in the garden at home and there were some um, butterflies out there and I noticed one laying eggs and I got a really quick clip of that and then another um, caterpillar that was changing into its chrysalis. So just those really short clips and I could take them in and say, you know, this happened this morning in the garden. And uh, for kids that are visual learners, they might relate more to that than just talking about it or showing them a still picture. All right, so how are we going to pay for all of this? Well, one of the best ways to pay for it, I think, is through the NSTA awards program. Um, on the NSTA website, there's a section called About NSTA, and then it has a section, um, uh, Nominate um, a Teacher for an Award uh, or Apply for a Competition. And so if you look there, you're going to find a ton of awards, and I've, um, I've listed a couple of them, the Delta Education Award and the Shell Science Teaching Award, $1,000 or $10,000. Um, one of the great things about NSTA awards for teachers, the money goes directly to teachers. Um, and then also it pays your way to the conference usually. And uh, it gives you an opportunity to do something big. So if you had $10,000, just think of the nice outdoor learning area that you could um, provide for your students. Another $10,000 award is the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science and Mathematics Teaching. Um, the, there are teachers that win this award in all 50 states, so a teacher of science in every state receives the award each year. Um, then there's a picture of uh, some of the folks that went to the White House. Um, they usually um, meet the president or the first lady or some um, member of the, <coughs> the cabinet as well. And they win this trip to Washington where they're connected with leaders in science. And most importantly, um, in addition to the money, it connects you with all these other fantastic science teachers and you can share ideas and you kind of become part of a cohort of friends and colleagues that keep in touch. Um, the National Gardening Association is exhi exhibiting at this NSK conference and they have a website kidsgardening.com. They give the National Youth Gardening Grant. Um, it's about a thousand dollars in equipment and they send the equipment to you so there's no purchase order. You don't have to do any shopping. It all just comes to you. And they have some other grants um, for varying amounts that um, some are monetary and some are equipment. Um, NSTA Reports is our kind of newsletter or newspaper type publication. And when it comes out, there's always a section on free resources. And so I just looked in a recent issue and highlighted a couple that have um, a relationship to outdoor science. But in every issue, there are those um, types of resources. There's always professional learning, and some of it's free, some of it not only free, but pays a stipend. And in my um, book, Outdoor Science, there's a whole um, section on writing grants, and I've geared it toward writing for science. And in um, that, I've got top 10 tips, and I wanted to share three of them with you today. Having a good plan is important, making sure that you match the need of, um, for the grant to what you're writing in it, and then also reading the application application carefully. Um, as a panel member for lots of grant applications, I've often found that when we have several really good applications, the one 
that wins is the one that followed the directions to the T. And so you don't want the font size or writing three paragraphs where they said to write two to keep you from winning some amazing grant. All right, we're going to brainstorm for just a minute, and I want you to think about things that you can bring inside from outdoors. If you want to talk to a colleague, you can. Um, I've started for you. Uh, one is seeds. I've given you a packet of seeds that I bought to take home, but um, I've also had my students harvest seeds from milkweed and other plants. Um, and then soil samples. In Georgia, we have uh, standards in both middle school and elementary school where students have to look at soil samples. So sometimes we go out and gather them uh, and bring them in. So take just a minute and think of something that you brought in. I'll give you about a minute to think about that. And then I'm going to have some of you share and uh, we'll try to fi finish our list. All right, let's come back together as a whole group and talk about um, a few items that we could bring in to work with kids. Um, what are some things that you bring in? Do you mind sharing? Okay, okay you, have a li you have your list? Sure. Sand, feathers, insects, rocks. Sand, feathers, insects, and rocks. All those are great examples. And sand makes me think uh, that the third grade standard that I've worked with in Georgia is comparing different kinds of soil. So uh, in, in the area of Georgia I live in, we have kind of a red clay soil. And that's one of them we compare to sand. So um, we have to go to a different part of the state to find sand. And uh, so uh, one interesting way to do that is when you travel somewhere, just get a dirt sample from there. I'm sure we've all done something like that or thought about it. Um, did you come up with some things? Um, in addition to they have she brings in critters, and then we have leaves, and then really anything from a stream. Um, kind of like yeah, so anything from a stream, including a water sample, um, leaves are a great example. There's a lesson in bringing outdoor science in, and it's really a throwback to my time in elementary school when a really popular activity, and I'm not sure at the time we had a, a lot of um, discussion about why we were doing it, but we used to do leaf rubbings, and it probably was a fall project, and it might have just been arts and crafts, but I think that it's, a, it's still a good activity. It was a good activity 40 years ago, and it's still a good activity if you have the students look at the parts of the leaf and what the leaf means to the plant. And uh, you can do that on lots of different levels. Um, anything else that folks in the back, anything that we didn't mention that you bring inside? Skulls. Skulls, great, yeah. Um, I had a, a teacher friend who, um, was, they called her the bone lady because she would pick up roadkill and she would clean, clean, clean the bones. Oh, and. and uh, <laughs> Oh, uh, so they bury them and then do they, I guess they dig them back up later? My dad just blow them on our stove. Oh, roadkill, he bull, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, there are lots of ways. If you know um, maybe a college chemistry teacher that has a vat of acid, they'll sometimes, you know, clean it for you that way. You can boil them on the stove. Um, yeah, of course, you know, there are a lot of safety issues with that, but I think um, as long as uh, you're making sure that it's clean um, and, and following safety guidelines of your school, then... You're all right. All right, so we've got a pretty good list there of things that we could bring in, and we want to think about some of the ways that we could investigate science with those. One of the things that I like to do early in the school year is take children on a walk outside and just let them think about what's in the schoolyard that animals could use, what resources are there. If you're going to plan an outdoor classroom, you can do this before you have the outdoor classroom and think about what resources you might need to add. Maybe there's no water source for animals nearby, so maybe you want to think about um, a bog or a small pond or even a bird bath uh, in the schoolyard. Well, I want to talk about the animal artifact activity and the inspiration behind it is my son Spencer. This is a picture of Spencer and me many years ago. And uh, so when he was a little boy, he liked to play outside when I could get him to put that Game Boy down. And he came up to me one day and he says, Daddy, this is a feather that I want to give you. This is your prize for today because I love you and I just want to give you something special. So I'm outside grading papers and he is playing. So I just kind of put the feather aside, drop it, and um, I keep grading papers. Um, I guess the wind blew it away or something. But anyway, he came back in a little bit and says, Daddy, I want to play with that feather. Where is it? So we couldn't find it. So I put down what I was doing and we started looking. Well, we found maybe not that feather, but we found some other feathers and lots of interesting um, natural items. And so I realized that I had not been a very good parent by letting that feather escape me. And so we decided to put them in some little um, plastic boxes. And so uh, we created these and they were Spencer's artifact boxes. And he would find things like 
an insect that had expired or uh, a butterfly wing. Um, let's see, this one, some of these I found since he was little, but this one is actually one that he found when he was little and it's part of a beetle, two of the sections of the beetle's body and there's two legs left. So uh, these are from Spencer's artifact box or what's left of it. And um, even from a trip to the beach, we have uh, a couple of pieces of coral. So I ended up taking this to school and using it in teaching because I woke up one day and realized that I had been outside playing with him all weekend and I didn't have um, anything planned for school that day. Not a good recommendation, but I was a young teacher, so I'll blame it on that. So um, we collected the items, we put them in the box, and then I kind of started doing this purposefully with my students. And we had a writing test that we had to do. So what I did is I gave every student an artifact to hold and I asked them to write a story starter, just a sentence or two about that artifact. Um, it could be fiction, it could be factual. And they were writing um, to um, get a story started. And so I've got a little spot for you on your handout that says animal artifact or fiction. And animal artifact or fiction is one of the activities in Outdoor Science, a practical guide. And I have some samples in there. Um, another way to do that is just to have some photographs of animal artifacts. Uh, so, let's see, wait. What, what level were you teaching at, that? at that time I was teaching 6th and 7th grade and we had a standardized writing test and they had to write a certain amount with this prompt. And so um, I had them write their own prompts and then, then we'd let the class vote on one and we would practice with that because we had to practice a certain number of times and it really you know the practice we were given practice prompts we didn't have to use them but they were you know they were developed by adults some of them were pretty old and they were you know I hate to say but they were a little bit lame and you know I couldn't blame the kids <laughs> they knew they were gonna have to do this over and over so the, the idea and we were doing this in every every subject had to do it so in science I think we probably had to do it two or three times over a semester and some science teachers were looking at it as, well, I'm just going to stop what we're doing and I'm going to do this writing practice. I wanted them to write about science and I wanted it to have some meaning to them. And so I tried to incorporate some items that were related to what we were studying. So if we were studying rocks and soils, then every student was holding a rock or a little bag with a soil sample in it. If we were studying um, um, animals, then they were holding a feather or a butterfly wing. So let's take a, a minute and we'll write some samples. I'm going to ask a couple of you to share those with me. You've got a little spot on your um, handout there. Um, you, can, you can start a story, maybe it's a fictional story, or you can write something factual. Sometimes people like to write about what happened to the animal or why it lost whatever the item is. So if it's a butterfly wing, you can think about did the butterfly die when it lost this wing or was it already dead? Or if it's a bird feather, did it hurt when they lost it? Where were they going? Did, you know, were they injured? So take a minute, maybe two minutes, and uh, I'll check back with you, and we'll share some of those. All right, I'm going to give you just another minute. Uh, while you're doing that, I'm writing a, a Twitter um, post, and I'm just saying teachers writing a story, uh, story starter during an outdoor science session at NSTA 14. So let's share some of our um, story starters or whatever you chose to write. Can I get two or three volunteers to do that? Come on. Um, red oak tree cookie or tree ring. This tree was cut to make way for school garden. I'm gonna, do, you, do you mind? Here. Okay. Start All right, from the so right. you're going to read your story starter report. Red oak tree cookie or tree ring. This tree was cut to make way for a school garden. The students decided to recycle the tree's trunk by plugging it with shiitake mushroom spawn. We cut a few cookies so future classes could learn about tree rings, count them, and look at red oak bark. Excellent. All right, well, that one is different than I've, I've ever had, and I think tree cookies are a great way to, um, to bring science in. Um, would one of you like to read for me? you have something? You'll do it? Okay. All right. A feather is living. It is no longer alive, but at one time it was part of a living creature. Feathers are structures that enable birds to use their wings to fly. In colonial times, feather shafts could be filled with ink and used for writing. Really good. So uh, that one was uh, pretty detailed, and I think that um, it reminds me of something that my middle school students might have written. Um, sometimes when um, uh, elementary students write, they might write something really simple, 
And it could be something as simple as, um, um, you know, I'm a bird on my way, uh, on my way migrating and I lost a feather. And they might write real, you know, just one really simple sentence. But it's okay because maybe they're just going to write a paragraph for their story or two paragraphs. Um, what grade levels do you all teach? Um, I teach 12 all the way down to nine. Okay, and you? Third. Third. It's 7th and 8th. 7th and 8th. 9th and 10th. What grade level? 9th and 10th. Okay, so we have high school all the way down. Well, um, I think you can see and use your um, own ideas to put with this, but it can end up being a powerful teaching tool um, where kids are kind of taking responsibility for their own learning. So you're giving them some choice. And at times I have asked them to include certain vocabulary words. Um, a good place to look for those vocabulary words now are the NGSS standards. Even if you're not in a state that's um, adopting NGSS, the next generation science standards are um, our new national standards. So we should all be kind of looking at those to think about um, what's appropriate at different grade levels and different science topics to teach. So I encourage you to let those inform um, not only your teaching, but some of the specific activities that you're doing. Okay, and there's an update on Spencer. Um, I wanted you, since you saw him as a young boy, he's now uh, 23. He's an actor in Atlanta. Um, he was football player number seven in the blind side. He didn't have a speaking role, but you can see number seven in the back of his head. And then he has his most prominent part in that is he's walking down the hallway in a green shirt when the teacher takes um, the character play Michael Orr outside. So, uh, and he's been in an episode of Drop Dead Diva. So there's Spencer Rich, and I hope that uh, you'll see him on a red carpet soon. All right, yeah, because then he can, you know, instead of me coming out doing all these gigs, trying to earn a dollar, he can support me. So uh, this is my friend David Mizajewski, and you might see him every now and then. He's often on the Today Show or like Wendy Williams. He was at an NSTA conference, and the, he works for the National Wildlife Foundation. They have lots of great resources for um, teachers and students, and uh, they have lesson plans occasionally. They post grants. So that's a great resource, and it, I think it's more geared toward um, middle grades and high school. All right, so I had mentioned early on that I would talk about, uh, I think, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and their um, Great American Backyard Bird Count. Um, and this is their website. It's on your list, on your handout, birds.cornell.edu. And the Great American Backyard Bird Count uh, is an event that they host, and you could do this any time, really, but they do it in February. And what they're doing is asking people just to put out a bird feeder, to put out bird seed, and then to count the number of birds that come. Um, they're having um, students and teachers and parents count species. They try to do it over a weekend so that it can become a community event. I've done this in schools where I had great parent support and where I had almost no parent support. So when I had little parent involvement, what I would do is I would post uh, the put up the bird feeder like Thursday afternoon and early Friday morning, fill it with seeds, and we'd watch it all day Friday. Then we'd watch it a little bit on Monday. And so that would be kind of our weekend watch. And a few kids might do it. But that way, all the students had some data they could work with. If you have really involved parents, you might even have, um, if you're having a PTA meeting or you're having uh, open house or something, you might even give out little bags of seeds. Or um, uh, you, if you go to the, their um, booth in the exhibit hall today, they have uh, some coupons. and It's a discount for bird seed, and it also is a instructions for making a bird feeder. So you could get that, give it out to parents, send it home. Yeah, they do. They have the, yeah, the one that goes on the window. So that window feeder that they give away free, uh, it's a great example of if you've got a window, you don't have to go outside to teach outdoor science or to relate what's going on outdoors indoors, you know. And I actually I have, um, uh, I give those, their free feeders away in a lot of my presentations. And so um, they said, well, here, take one and put it up at your home. So I have one in my kitchen window. And so, you know, even when it's cold weather, I'm, I'm watching birds outside. All right, um, and, and I want to talk a little bit about pollinators. One of the questions I was asked when I was writing Outdoor Science, a practical guide, is why does your animal chapter focus on um, butterflies and bees and birds? And I said, well, you know, animals that can fly in and out of a schoolyard are the ones that um, are easiest to teach with because you're not trying to corral any animals, you're not trying to attract animals that aren't naturally there, um, and, and uh, for the most part, they're safe. I mean, with a bee, you might have a bee sting, but uh, 
that's all kind of in how you plan and, wh and what's going on. So this website, pollinator.org, has great curriculum materials featuring bees. Um, on the, the Outstanding Science Trade Book this year, there's a book called Flight of the Honey Bee. And it's, it's kind of a, I'd say, upper elementary book, but it has some good science information in it. And I found that even when I was teaching middle school that my students still liked to hear or read aloud book every now and then if I could work it in. So we're going to um, play a little game. If I could uh, get all of you to come up here, I've got some stickers for you. <coughs> and can I ask you to be a flower? So we're going to play a pollinator game. And the pollinator game um, is going to um, have all of you become either, I'm going to give, make you a bee here. You're either going to be a flower or an insect. Would be a bee for me. And so, all right, so I'll be a butterfly too. All right, so what we're going to do is uh, the folks, if we could get our two flowers, will you come out here? So these are our two flowers. Why don't you stand up here? Would you go like back to the, the table right there? And then um, we're going to go by and um, what you might want to do is we have a yellow flower and an orange flower. So I'm trying to help you think about your grade level of students. I started this doing it with really like second grade young students and we would just go by and fist bump and say pollination. Um, but you might want to be strategic about it because certain animals are attracted to different color flowers. So you might want to think about that. If whichever flower, if you go to both, that's fine, whatever you want to do. But if you choose to go to one and you're not going to go to the other one, you might want to pollinate that one more than once. You also might want to think about why your animal is going there. What do they want from the flower? So uh, I'm going to ask you to go fist bump at least twice, either flower or both. And since we're, um, we have some upper grades teachers here, let's, let's have a, at least a one sentence exchange about why you're there, if why, what do you want from the flower, and then the flower can tell you what they want from you. All right, so I'll, I will start out by saying, here, I'm a butterfly. I want to um, come to drink some nectar. If I drink some nectar, is there anything I can do for you? Can you take my pollen to another flower? I will. Have a good day. Thank you, flower. Hi, I'm a butterfly, and I'm here to see if you would give me some nectar. And if you do, I'll do whatever you would like me to do, within reason, I guess. Oh, could you put some of that pollen down in my statement? Sure, I will be happy to. All right, thank you. Hi, I'm B. Hey, so she asked me to bring some pollen to you. All right, there you go. All right. Okay. Well, we can have a seat now. Um, thank you for playing along. I think that uh, one of the fun things about that for kids is that even if we're doing it with older kids, I've done it with seventh graders uh, and second graders. So there's, those are the two grade levels I've done it with. And even with the middle school students, you know, of course, they're going to laugh and think it's lame in the beginning. But if you give them a little bit of specific vocabulary and a little bit of what they have to do, your kinesthetic learners are going to like it. It's not, you know, sitting in the chair and doing something. So yeah, they're moving um, and, you know, you'll have enough kids in the classroom that if they need to talk about what they're going to do at lunch, who they're going to sit with or what they're doing after school, it'll be all right. You know, they can they can have a little bit of socialization in there with it, too. And then um, I use these sheets of um, stickers that have uh, other insects, too. And so one of the things that um, you can do if you have um, insects that don't fly or that are really poor flyers, you could tell them that they, they only have enough time to visit one flower or two. And uh, that's another way to work in the purpose of what they're there for. For instance, if I'm a ladybug, I'm probably going to the milkweed flower because I want to eat some of the aphids there. I don't care about anything else on the plant. Um, so, you know, if I'm a ladybug, I'll say, hey, flower, can I come up and eat some of the aphids off of you? You know, and the flower might say, well, you can, but if you don't eat at least 10, I'm going to kick you off, you know. So, you can have all these scenarios going on and make it as um, simple or complicated as is appropriate for your students. And uh, I don't have it on here, but there's a website that's pollinator. Well, wait, maybe it was on that bee thing. I, was, I think it's pollinator.org. Was that the one on the bee slide? Okay, on pollinator.org, 
they have some versions of this game and they're a little bit different because I just um, dreamed this in my sleep one night, maybe, I don't know. I just, you know, something that kind of came to me. I didn't look in a book to find it, but uh, they have several versions of it and it, I think some of them are pretty good as far as if you teach what this level, it's a little more complicated or simple. So take a look at this. All right, um, in Georgia, our state butterfly is a swallowtail. And so I like to plant parsley um, because it's a, a plant that can withstand colder weather, a good school year plant. They're also attracted to dill and fennel. Um, and I wanted to briefly talk to you about um, a butterfly garden that I helped create this past year with former First Lady Rosalind Carter. I was asked to help write some curriculum for a butterfly garden that was going to be at the Jimmy Carter National Historic Site. And then um, one of the ladies that works down there was talking with Mrs. Carter about my work at schools. And so Mrs. Carter um, was looking for somebody to help her design a garden in their yard. And uh, so um, she wanted this garden to have a purpose. The, the National Park Service owns their property, but she wanted it to have a purpose and an educational value. So this is an area of the garden here. And um, their house is actually kind of back here behind us in this picture about where that car is. And uh, there's Ms. Carter and I talking about what kind of plants she would need. And I think it's fascinating because she's 86 years old and I, think, I hope at that age that I'm still creating and still trying to come up with new ideas and new things to do. And um, what was announced later, uh, not at the time we were working on it, is that this is um, the garden where President and Mrs. Carter will be buried. And she didn't want it just to have their tombs there. She wanted it to have some purpose. And I thought that was pretty incredible for somebody at that age to think, you know, let's have a purpose and let's make it educational other than the fact that some famous people were buried here. Let's, you know, when kids come here, what else can they see? What other signs can we have for them to read about? Um, and then uh, they've created this whole Carter Butterfly Trail. Um, and this is a picture of us releasing uh, butterflies in planes. And um, the Butterfly Trail goes all over the Carter Historic Site. And then they give out information on how to create your own uh, garden at home. So uh, kind of a neat experience and one that I like to share with teachers. All right, you so. Know, you did other places and now using sort of that design to get inspired to do more? Um, yeah, uh, actually, um, and I don't know if I had it on the, yeah. Um, if you go to jimmycarter.info, that's um, the educational site that's related to the Jimmy Carter National Historic Site. And there's a lady from the Georgia Department of Education who's a full-time employee there. And she um, is keeping a list of people who want to be on the trail. And uh, then she has the plan that um, I helped Mrs. Carter develop and uh, just gives you ideas for plants and kind of tips for butterfly gardening. And they're asking people to do this at their home or at schools. And so um, the school list is actually being launched this spring. Uh, I think they, they just have the listing there and maybe the first school that visited the garden is listed. But, um, you're, you're welcome to go to that site and, and request the form to be listed. All right, um, so I gave you seeds and we're not gonna uh, look at the two different types today. I'm just gonna send some with you, but we'll talk about the activity. Um, this book, 10 Seeds by Ruth Brown, is one that I discovered when I was teaching middle school. It's really a primary grades book and it only has a couple of words per page, but I had my students write their own story about it and it's really, well illustrated and, and really uh, specifically illustrated in kind of the, the plants and the seeds are really, I guess you could say anatomically correct and they're, um, the illustrations are, are so rich, they're almost like photographs. So it shows, you know, like the, the seed underground and what's happening to it and that kind of thing. So uh, I was teaching a, a unit on plants in seventh grade and, and that's when I had my kids write about it. Um, in Bringing Outdoor Science In, there's a, um, a kind of a comparison activity, um, comparing two different types of seeds. I like to give students a seed that maybe is not as familiar to them as say a sunflower seed or a pumpkin seed, but maybe um, a seed that they're not familiar with and just let them imagine what plant it might have come from. And if you um, go at the end of the season and buy seeds from a hardware store or um, a garden shop, they'll often either give them to you if you tell them your teacher or they're usually discounted and uh, so it's a really cheap resource. And this goes along well with, I'd mentioned the leaf activity where you're doing a leaf rubbing and I have students compare two different types of leaves. And I think this goes well with that and kind of making predictions 
I also think seeds are a great um, prompt for writing. So if you want to let students have a seed in their hand and do some writing about it, make predictions, that works well. Um, on your handout, uh, I've listed one of my favorite websites, monarchwatch.org. The picture there is of a monarch butterfly that's been tagged. Monarch Watch website is run by the University of Kansas, and they are the, the um, keeper of all things monarch, um, and they provide these tags. There's a little bit of a cost, but not much. And so your students can tag butterflies, and then they, you can track on the website where they go. Um, it's a, that is a fall activity, so if you're interested in doing that, it's something that, that you could start looking at the website now and be prepared for this fall. But there are other resources there, and they have some pretty high-level um, high school resources. A lot of high school students have done uh, science fair projects that are related to monarch butterflies and uh, done some pretty impressive work. And so there's a lot of good ideas for teaching and learning on that side. Um, we, when we were talking about bringing things inside, somebody mentioned critters, and one of the things I like to do is get some critter containers and bring in two or three different animals and have students look at them. If you don't want to go out and find them yourselves, you could go to a bait shop and bring in like a mealworm, um, an earthworm, and a cricket, um, and there you have three different types of critters. Um, somebody mentioned bringing in pumpkins, I think. Um, my sister used to do this. She's an elementary teacher. She would do this in the fall for um, math, and they would bring in a pumpkin, take the seeds out. Um, I guess they weighed it before they took the seeds out, weigh it again, then try to get a weight for each seed, and read a book to go with it. So it's pretty good um, math and science activity. Um, these students uh, were fifth graders, and we had some seeds that um, a local store had given me, and what they did is they planted sunflower seeds that were produced in several different years. And they, I said, well, you've got to come up with your research question. So their first question was, which year uh, were the seeds better? And I said, well, you know, is better really a scientific word? How are we going to qualify better so, or quantify better? And so what they did, they came back with, they had more specific questions. How many seeds uh, will germinate if the, if the seeds were produced in a, a past year? Uh, and um, will the flowers be larger if the seeds are new? And will there be any difference in the height of the plant? So what they found is that um, the flowers were the same size, the plants could grow to the same height. The only difference they found were that older seeds might germinate less frequently so that they were, there were fewer plants from older seeds, but the quality of the plants based on their size was the same. So you all have seeds to take with you, and I hope you'll share them with the kids. Well, I wanted to also talk about, I've mentioned a couple of books that are, are outdoor related that you could read outside, but I wanted to share a few more for um, ideas for both reading and writing. In the Outdoor Science Class Pack, they have some of these little waterproof notebooks. Um, and then you can also find these on the exhibit hall um, in a couple of the other exhibitors. But I, I like to take those outside because kids can get them muddy and wet and nothing happens to them. And they're really good for writing with pencil in case they want to erase. Some of my favorite ideas for writing about outside in addition to seeds are animal migration, changing season, if you're in a grade level that teaches about the moon, keeping a moon journal. Um, a favorite middle school book, I used to read this to my seventh graders, is Who Killed Cock Robin by Jean Craighead George. And, um, it's kind of an ecological mystery. There are several other books that are ecological mysteries too, but that's my favorite, I guess. And uh, when I did that, I paired up with a reading teacher and they were doing um, some reading comprehension work in the classroom and we were kind of supporting each other so that I could have the kids doing some science activities and experiments that were related while they were doing the comprehension part in her class. Um, how many of you are familiar with Picture Perfect Science? Well, um, this is a series of books. There's even another one now called Even More Picture Perfect Science. They use the 5E method um, of inquiry for science teaching, and they base each chapter and unit that they write on a couple of books. Um, and uh, let's see if I want to go one more. Um, yeah, I wanted to show you Turtle, Turtle, Watch Out is um, in Picture Perfect Science uh, in a um, chapter that they have on sea turtles. Um, lots of other great books in there. And then let's look back at this. The Outstanding Science Trade Book List is on the NSTA 
website under publications, OSTB, Outstanding Science Trade Books. These are just a couple of titles that are my favorites. Rachel Carson and her book that changed the world um, about a famous scientist and then the first garden that I had mentioned previously about the White House gardens. Um, do you all have any books that you share with students that you can think of you want to share with us? Yeah, or anything related to science or the outdoors. <laughs> yeah. One of my favorites for middle school for, uh, teaching with plants is seeds, stems, and stamens. Seeds, stems, and stamens. And it came out probably three or four years ago, and it's on the Outstanding Science Trade Book list. Living Sunlight, Living sunlight for teaching photosynthesis. Um, another one that's uh, um, interesting in that it ties in social studies with science is Plants on the Trail of Lewis and Clark. Plants on the Trail of Lewis and Clark, and it kind of is uh, almost a journal-like story of all the plants that they discovered when they were um, exploring the West, and it has photographs um, of what the plants look like. So they, you know, somebody has gone out and photographed these plants that, that are still there but were discovered at that time. Uh, a pretty simple activity outdoors is just measuring trees. Um, is any of you familiar with the GLOBE program? So um, in the GLOBE program, they have an um, activity where you, your students can make a clinometer to measure the height of the trees. Um, and it, but it's such a simple thing just to measure the diameter, and you had mentioned tree cookies. So, so we do that, and then um, we have the kids sort of pick a tree in the schoolyard. Yeah and follow that tree's growth in the spring over a four week period. Um, you know, right about now in New Hampshire when nothing's happening, yeah. the leaves are out and they have to keep growing it once each week and writing observations about it. This is yeah. First grade. Cool. Okay. So, yeah, so yeah. adopting a tree, yeah, adopting a tree for a few weeks and kind of keeping a journal or the, a record of its growth, how does it change? Do you see buds on it? Are there blooms? Yeah. Are there leaves when it starts? Are there any yeah. 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 Is there life, other life around the tree? So there's so many things that can be done with that. Trees are a fascinating place to see. Here's another picture of the same activity in yeah. different schoolyards. So the difference is this was a friend of mine who sent this photo, and they had no outdoor classroom whatsoever. It's just part of their schoolyard. And uh, so I was I'd sent that out to some of my teacher friends to say, you know, if you don't have an outdoor classroom, I know you take kids outside, what do you do? And, and so, and then this is a picture at my school, and there's my outdoor classroom. But really, at this moment, we're not really using the outdoor classroom. They're just out managing the trees. Now, we did go back and sit in the seating area and talk about it, but I could have done it whether I had the outdoor classroom or not. It's just kind of a good example of you don't have to, you know, spend $1,000 or $10,000 to build some outdoor classroom to, to get outside. Oh, great, yeah, stand by their tree and, and share about it. Really cool. It was like a tree museum or something. So these are first graders, and they were um, riding on the math patio, and we had this program called Calendar Math that we had to do for 10 minutes a day, and I absolutely hated like being required, and it was literally in a box. <laughs> you know? So I literally thought outside of the box, and I asked my principal, I said, you know, filling out a blank calendar on a piece of paper over and over again in school year is such a lame activity. Could we do ours outdoors? And so I did have some kids at the beginning that had a little trouble with that, but I found that eventually they did this and I could keep their interest more by doing it outside. When we would do it inside, it would rain. I would always have kids that didn't finish, just didn't care. And uh, so this was a lot of fun to do outdoors. These kids are similarly uh, riding on the patio and they're doing skip counting uh, and just five, 10, 15. So these are second graders and that was one of the second grade standards. Um, let's think about, we're gonna wrap up soon, but thinking about things that you can do um, if you don't have an outdoor classroom, bringing it in. Um, we wanna make sure that we're integrating um, other subjects when we can because you know the natural world encompasses all subjects, not just science. And I also just want to throw out that I think that going outdoors um, encourages the type of learning that we want to be thinking about with our students. It, it can lead to rich discussions 
in a lot of the concepts that we find in NGSS, um, teachers who go outside have already been doing that for a long time. So um, let me leave you with this pro quote from uh, President Jimmy Carter. He said, it's good to realize that if love and peace can prevail on earth and if we can teach our children to honor nature's gifts, the joys and beauties of the outdoors will be here forever. And I do think that um, as teachers, it's great when we can model a responsibility for taking care of the natural world and uh, leave that with our students and really be an instrument for um, influencing how they'll take care of the earth when we're no longer around. And I do have another quote, and uh, I won't read this whole one to you, but it talks about the warmth of the sun being a vital element and um, that students will remember those teachers who also exude that warmth. And I want to thank you for being here this afternoon on a Saturday. It's pretty impressive to me when teachers want to come talk about science and uh, hope that you've had a great conference. And um, I'll be at the bookstore at 4 o'clock if you'd like to come continue the conversation.